Welcome everyone, good evening. My name is Mara Bronfeld and I am so happy to welcome everyone this evening. I joined Hadar earlier this month as our new Director of Children and Families, and it has been such a joy for me to be able to meld my two favorite roles in life, um, that of professional Jewish education professional and that of parent. Um, and tonight, as you know, is the first of our three-part series where we get to dig in and explore the why, the how, and the what of, um, of learning with our children. And it's wonderful to be here with you tonight, and we're so glad that you carved out time from your busy schedules and your hectic days and potentially bedtime routines with your own children to be able to, uh, to join us tonight. I want to just say a word of introduction about uh, Hadar Children and Families, which is a new division for us and why we're doing it and what we're hoping to do and how this series, which hopefully uh, you can come to more than one piece of and folks who weren't able to make it tonight who you may know, you should encourage them to come back even though they weren't here for this bit. Um, this is really uh, on some level, I think of it as like the newest old department at Hadar. <laughs> um, it's a brand new piece of what we're doing. Um, and in that sense, it's, uh, it's kind of a totally fresh aspect of our work. Uh, Mara's arrival really represents, uh, you know, kind of staffing up uh, this whole division that we're working on uh, at another level. Uh, Hannah Kupetz, who is also here this evening, uh, though recently having a child of her own, and so therefore living, living the dream that we're all working towards here. Uh, has been pushing this work forward over the last year. Um, and uh, it's, it's a super exciting piece of what we're doing, but I wanna really emphasize Hadar as an organization has always been about advancing a vision of living Jewish life, learning Torah, uh, having this be something that is integrated into the way people are day to day. Um, you don't do that. You don't build a society, you don't build a dream without investing in uh, our youngest generation, our youngest members. And that's the sense in which it feels like the oldest piece of what we're doing. Uh, I feel like I, I had a dream of us doing this work right from the start. It's just, it wasn't a right moment to do it. One of the blessings of the pandemic was we suddenly found ourselves in people's living rooms and doing just for my own biography. So my kids are already older. Um, my oldest is 18 and then I have a 16 year old and I have a 12 year old. Um, and I've done a lot of years of, you know, learning. You can ask, you can ask them later uh, if you get them on the couch, you know, whether uh, it was all positive or it was, you know, torture. Uh, but we did a lot of learning together at home. Um, and it was funny. I asked my 12-year-old, actually, just at dinner tonight. I was like, you know, we're doing this session about learning with your parents. Like, what do you think? Why? Why is, why is that important? Um, and he said something um, that I thought was striking. It goes to one of the points I want to emphasize. He said, I don't even know how to answer that question. I mean, it's just kind of like, duh. <laughs> of, of course, like, I don't know. We always did it together. So I, I can't even imagine otherwise. Now, whether you're at a stage, which some of you from the opening poll are, where actually you're right at the beginning of your child's mental and educational development, and you may actually be laying down a groundwork now for they won't remember anything else, or you're starting later on in the process and you're trying to lean in, um, actually that aspect of it just being like an integrated part of your life, if it's what you want to do at whatever the frequency is in whatever way, um, is itself, I think, a hugely significant piece of this. For me, um, a kind of pivotal moment as a parent, I will never forget it, when my now 18-year-old was, uh, was like one. <laughs> I remember being on the park with her, I was pushing her on a swing, and I just had this moment, it kind of descended on me, where I realized, oh my God, if there are things that I want her to care about, and things that I want her to know, and want her to know that I care about, it's on me. No one else is going to do it. I can send her to all the programs. I can send her to all the schooling. We sent our kids to a lot of programs and a lot of schooling. But if at the end of the day, I want to convey something as a value, actually, I had to do it. 
And my number one answer of why you should learn Torah with your kids is, well, actually, anything in life that you really care that your children will get, you make sure actually to model for them and do for them in some way. There might be things you're like guilty about and you think should happen, but then there's the things that, you no, know, they're actually organically central and critical to everything you want your kids to walk through the world with. And we never actually completely farm those things out to other people. We always find a way to own them um, and be the, the primary mediators and communicators, even if we have lots of other, uh, lots of other partners on that. So I, I wanna turn to a few kind of texts and formulations here that have been powerful for me in thinking about why to learn with your children. And there's sort of the aspect of why to learn <laughs> with your children, why to learn with your children, and why to learn with your children. Uh, and I wanna actually unpack the different pieces of that, all of which I think are really important um, and really powerful. So we're gonna put up a link here for uh, a set of just a few sources that we're gonna look at here, which I invite you to click on. Uh, I will, unless I get a request to specifically share screen, I'll let you go on that uh, yourself so you can manage seeing the faces and whatever size you want. But if you do want us to uh, actively share that screen also, uh, we can do that. Um, so what you have here are um, a, a, number, a number of sort of bullet points that capture things um, and a few sources that I wanna, that I wanna go into here. Um, first thing which really goes to, it's such a basic point and it's really such a basic text, but I actually think we miss the full force of it, um, is a claim that for me is just so central for any kind of powerful uh, life-shaping education, which is that Jewish learning is meant to be immersive and continually reinforced, okay? It is immersive and continually reinforced. It is in this sense, not like math, okay? Like you can actually, my, my son is learning calculus just fine by having it a couple hours a day with a set of assignments that he then turns his brain off of. That's not actually what the Torah describes to us as the nature of the project of passing on the Torah to our children. And again, it's a passage so many of us have seen so many times but I wanna underscore a basic piece of it. In Dvarim, in Deuteronomy, these words that I'm charging with you today, impress them upon your children and speak of them. And then we get a list of times when you need to do it. When you stay at home, when you are away, when you lie down, and when you get up. Now, you know, the traditional sort of understanding and application of this to normative Jewish practice is, well, when you get, when you lie down and when you get up, that's how we know that, you know, you say the Shema. That's how we know that you recite basic words of Torah in the evening and in the morning. But we can't actually lose the plain sense of the force of this passage, where this is the idiomatic way of saying, all the time. Don't compartmentalize this. Don't make this something, yeah, I do that for an hour in the morning, then it's gone. No, it's got to also be in the evening. Don't do it just for an hour in the evening. It's got to also be in the morning. Perhaps most powerfully for this discussion, don't just do it when you're on the road in some other place where you've booked an hour or a day or tuition dollars for something to get done. Actually, your home is also a critical and central piece of this. And it's really less about actually the hours logged as much as a notion that we are, uh, we want to be surrounded by this. You want to feel that there's no sort of area in your life that is potentially untouched by the things that are most important, right? Like when we teach our kids manners, right? It's not like, yeah, as long as you're like, you know, well-behaved between 8 and 10 a.m., then that's fine. I assume you're learning that and all bets are off. 
This is actually about character education. This is about culture building. Um, and that's part of why we asked the question at the beginning, like when, what kind of periodicity are you thinking about doing this with? Because truth be told, great, daily is a great answer. Weekly is a great answer. Monthly can be a great answer. But the very notion of periodicity, the idea that this comes around, it's actually part of the background and fabric of life. Um, that's, what, that's what this passage is about. And even the following lines understood to be about tefillin and mezuzah and these very sort of like concrete uh, distillations of having Torah present in our life, again, idiomatically at their base are, this stuff should be on your arms, meaning when you're doing stuff in the day, it should integrate. It should be between your eyes when you're thinking. It should be connected to that. Um, and it should on some level, as much as possible, define your home. So that's piece one. I think that's really important about the why. One of the whys of learning with your kids as a parent, and particularly at home, is there's no replacement for learning at home in some way, discussing at home with uh, a parent and with a child, to giving a child a sense of, this is just part of who I am, right? The same way like dinner is a part of who I am uh, and the other things that happen at home. That's piece one. All right, so this notion of it being immersive and continually reinforced and to kind of distinguish it from other things in that regard. Um, I, don't, I don't do karate with my kid at home. Like he goes out and does that um, in a dojo, you know, for an hour, an hour and a half, a week, and he learns karate. But I'm not actually trying to make karate a part of who he is. I just want him to learn karate and to interact with other kids who do that and build himself up in that way. This is different. So that's, that's piece one. Um, moving to the second page here, um, what I think is a really remarkable and insightful text, uh, the point of which I'm kind of summarizing here in the principle of just as nature abhors a vacuum, so does a mind. And the ways in which all of us, uh, sometimes despite our best efforts as parents, uh, come to realize that our kids are going to be filled up with content one way or the other. That is to say, one of the answers of why learn Torah with your children is your children are going to be absorbing something no matter what. And by default, the general culture and the streaming services and whatever it is are going to fill that up by default. And you might as well learn a lot of Torah with them, or you might as well find a way to keep this sort of on the agenda uh, and in the mix. And this passage from the Tosefta, rabbinic text from 2000 years ago, also I think not understood often at full depth, has a very deep insight here. So it's talking about the age at which kids become obligated in various Jewish ritual practices. Right, so the simple answer we would say, oh, when you become bar bat mitzvah, right? It must be ages 12, 13. Um, and that's sort of where the, you know, the, the practical tradition ended up going. Um, but this text reflects an earlier conception where people become obligated in mitzvot on some level when they're able to do them. Uh, and even in the later conception where the age of bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah becomes very important, there's still a notion that there's sort of like a training, a stepping into mitzvot uh, that uh, is, you know, sort of part of the foreground of that. And I just love the way this text articulates it because it says it as follows. The first line really is enough to give you the whole picture. When children know how to shake, they are obligated in lulav. They're obligated on the holiday of Sukkot to pick up a lulav and to start to shake. This text, I think, is often misread as meaning when a child knows how to shake a lulav, then you give them a lulav. And I do not think that's what it means. I think it means when they know how to shake a lightsaber, when they know how to pick up a stick and start waving it around, then you know it's time for them to take our stick and wave it around. Similarly, the next line, 
When children know how to wrap, they're obligated in tzitzit. I think this means when a child starts dressing up in capes. When a child demonstrates, I find it interesting and I know how to wrap myself in a garment, that's the time you wrap yourself in our garment, which has its own specific meaning. And I think the proof of this is the next line, that this is the way to read it. When a child begins to speak, that's when you know you have to teach them the Shema. You have to teach them the words, the stories, the expectations, but the words of the Torah, and you teach them Hebrew. That is to say, once you see they have the linguistic faculty developing, so then they have to speak our language. They have to tell our stories. They have to start reciting our mantras and the things that we say on a regular basis. There's actually this deep awareness in this text that the way it is to develop as a human being is you pick up certain skills that are fundamentally general human skills. And then the requirement of the parent, and the parent is inserted in that, uh, in that last line about the sort of linguistic redirection. The role of the parent is, you know your child better than anyone else, what they're ready for. What analog in Jewish content and practice are they ready for based on what you see them doing? And that actually the moment that you have to jump in and do that is at that moment. Right, so this is not to discourage anyone who's further along the path, but for people who are early on in the path, like I always tell people, no, you don't teach your kid to read Torah in preparation for uh, their bar bat mitzvah. You start teaching them Torah when you see that they're memorizing song. When you see that they can actually read words in a nursery rhyme book or something else and follow the cadence and sing it, then, whether you can do this yourself or you figure out who are the other people or tutors or the Hadar tutoring network, which we're hoping to build up in coming months, um, that's actually when you step in and you say, hey, this kid's ready to sing. Time for them to sing our song, right? And our song is the Torah. Um, so that's a second piece here. This notion of why to learn Torah with your kids is your kids are going to be learning stuff anyway. Um, the question is, do you want to have agency and direction uh, in terms of, of what that is? Um, another thing which itself is sort of obvious, um, and again, I, I don't, this is a text, I, I never teach this text um, to people who are picking up Jewish learning later in life. And because I don't think this text is the be all and end all. But I do teach this text when I'm talking to parents, because I think it's important. There was a very powerful set of articles and books. Uh, I think the, the whole book called uh, The Genius in All of Us from about like a decade ago, um, which did some sort of serious and actually terrifying work on uh, what was known as, still known as the word deficit. The ways in which children who were simply exposed to fewer words in the home as three-year-olds that was one of like the biggest predictors of their performance on the SAT, you know, more than a decade later. The, the basic notion of were you exposed repeatedly to a broad range of vocabulary at home ended up actually being a dramatic factor uh, in terms of all kinds of later uh, academic processes that played out. And there can be a parallel Torah deficit. Again, this is not, you, you can come back for next year, we'll do the Why Learn Torah as adults. And I'll tell you all the reasons why you got, you got plenty to do and there's, you know, there's uh, nothing to be hesitant about. But it's important when we're dealing with young children to actually recognize we have an extraordinary opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity when kids are young uh, to simply begin at the beginning. And this is this text in Mishnah Avot uh, by Elisha Ben Avuya, himself a fascinating rabbinic figure um, for whom some of his youthful learning didn't stick, uh, who nonetheless says, 
one who learns as a child what's it like, like having ink written on a new page. What's it like to learn as an adult, like having ink written on a page full of erasure. Uh, the metaphor here is one from the world of kind of parchment and where you don't just throw out a piece of paper, right? Like in other words, you might write something and then, okay, you don't need that anymore. So you erase and then you write again, but you never fully <laughs> erase what's there below. And so your second and third and fourth layer of writing is not as crisp. It doesn't sink in in the same way. Um, you know, any of us that's tried to learn a language as an adult, as opposed to try to learn a language as a child or just mastering a language as a child, we know this, right? We, we feel the ways in which this is true. Um, and while again, none of this should discourage learning as an adult, Alicia Benavouya is capturing something here, uh, which is that actually, kids, when they learn things when they're young, um, have the ability for them to kind of sink in uh, in a deep way that can be remarkable. And sometimes that can be really rich stuff that's about all kinds of texts maybe they get exposed to and connections they can make and ways they can talk about it with their friends if they're blessed to have peers who have a similar discussion. But sometimes it's just really basic things. Um, are they hearing? Are they getting the chance to be exposed to like the sounds of what the Torah sounds like when we read it? Um, are they getting a chance to learn various, you know, rituals and brachot and other things that will, for the rest of their life, potentially follow them as kind of skills and language and things that can connect them to other Jews? Um, these are things that um, it's, it's so valuable to seize the moment uh, of youth in order to uh, sort of settle that in. So it, those comments are, you know, connected, as I said, in some way, uh, the notion of uh, you know, why, why learn Torah <laughs> with your child? Um, so, right, why learn Torah with your child? Alicia Benavuya is sort of emphasizing what's the value of doing that, particularly when a child is, you know, when a person is young. Uh, why learn Torah with your child? Well, because they're going to learn something else if they don't learn that. Um, and why learn Torah with your child? Well, because you learning Torah with them is actually going to immerse them and potentially reinforce them uh, in all kinds of ways. But I want to add one last thing here, which has been very meaningful to, to me as a parent. Uh, and then we can open up for some sort of comments and, and questions on this, um, which is why learn Torah with your kids? Um, right? What's actually brought to the table with that? And here I'll just share, and I'm sure many of you have these experiences as well. Um, this notion, uh, phrase from Bishle, the book of Proverbs, uh, at least as it's not really, the original meaning of that means something else, but the way it's taken uh, uh, kind of traditionally is every child has their own path um, and you have to have education be tailored. So on some level, a parent knows better than anyone else what their child is, who their child is, and you know what they connect to, and what's more challenging for them. But there's a different angle here I want to just really lift up, which is I learned more about my kids by learning Jewish content with them than in some ways I learned about them uh, doing almost anything else with them. Because by uh, one of the things we did was we would like go through the, the Parsha together. We would just sort of read the content of the Torah through and ask questions and talk about it. Um, and I learned that my oldest child was a rule follower and that she was also incredible at remembering things from, you know, 10 Parshiot earlier and making a connection. Isn't this like that? Doesn't this connect to that things I wasn't even remembering? I learned that about her and how her mind worked. Um, I learned with my next oldest um, how much deep psychological insight he had into people's feelings and their character. When we would read the stories of Esav and Yaakov, and he would be right inside Esav's mind and feeling terrible for him and feeling sort of the pain of a son who was dispreferred and shafted in all kinds of ways, um, I learned something about my son in terms of kind of his character, his perceptiveness. 
Uh, and when we were talking about the construction of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle in the desert, and I was like, oh, there's no way they're going to follow this, but I'll at least try to sort of describe it. And I saw my youngest like creating a 3D model of it in his head. Like I could just see he was able to do that in a way the two oldest ones had not. Um, I learned that about him, right? I learned something about his spatial ability. Part of what's incredibly powerful about Torah um, and whatever corner of it, you know, you decide to take on is it's so varied. There are so many aspects of it. It's just an incredible opportunity to learn not just with your children, but actually about them. Um, and there's no way, I think, for anyone other than a parent to do the specific uh, kind of intimate, you know, grandparent, I think, could do this as well, but the specific sort of intimate connection that a family member has in that way. Um, so, so let me stop for being there. with us, and um, we look forward to learning with everyone and with your kids again soon.